Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Curtis Cravens. Um, I'm with the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and I have uh, the Coastal Protection Portfolio uh, for ORR. And so I'm happy to just take a couple of minutes and kick this off. Before I make my uh, just a couple of comments on where we are with our um, program, I just can we see a, uh, hands? How many people actually have been to Coney Island Creek? <laughs> that's good. Okay, great. So that's great. Because we're going to, that's fantastic. I wasn't sure it was going to be uh, that high a percentage. So that's great because we'll really want your feedback today and bringing that experience uh, um, to this session. This is a non panel session, it's interactive. Um, so, uh, and you'll be hearing more about that. I just want to take this moment to um, tell you a little bit about where we are. Um, with the uh, city's efforts, which is, works across all agencies, um, on the coastal protection portfolio and bring you up to speed. Coney is uh, one of the important initiatives. Um, as you may know, we haven't announced, uh, we're working closely with the Army Corps on the uh, east shore of Staten Island, and that's really at a critical point where the draft feasibility report will be out at the end of the month, fingers crossed. And then we're also working with the Army Corps on the Atlantic side of the Rockways in Jamaica Bay. And that work is proceeding in alternatives as well, and they are meeting with communities. So that's great. Those two projects are moving ahead. Um, we are also have announced, um, as you may know, that we are moving ahead with Red Hook. Um, we're in the procurement process in collaboration with the state um, for a $100 million first phase of Red Hook. Uh, so that's going to be moving, and you'll see that uh, uh, that will become more public, um, I think, later this summer. Uh, so keep an eye on that. We're also um, moving ahead with HUD-funded um, east side coastal resiliency between 23rd and Montgomery on uh, the east side, um, working closely with the Parks Department um, and other agencies on that project. So that is actually moving ahead. Um, very well uh, looking towards hopefully a 2017 groundbreaking for that project. Um, we are also doing a series of studies that are not fully funded in terms of capital. We are very aggressive in looking for funding for all our projects. We're moving ahead on the north shore of Staten Island to look at the Kilvan Cull Corridor and the Maritime Community. Um, you'll be hearing more of that in the months ahead. We are moving ahead in East Harlem with the Parks Department to look at the East Harlem waterfront. So that's that's an area where we'll be doing a study. We are working in Newtown Creek and Gowanus in these significant um, maritime um, MBIA uh, corridors. So that that is going ahead and we're going to be coming out with some analysis about that. And of course we have Coney Island Creek which is really a very strategic, I mean, I think it really tells the story that we've learned since Sandy about backdoor inundation. And um, as devastating as it was, I think you'll see today that there are numerous opportunities. And I just really want to thank, um, we can't do this work without the partnerships. We can't do it without the partnerships of our city agencies, um, on the NGOs, our consultants, and the other not-for-profits and community. We can't do it without any of those. Um, and you make up most of that group here today. So um, I just want to welcome you, and then I want to turn it over to um, our amazing procurement partner and consultant team, Elijah Hutchinson uh, of EDC. And Ronnie, are you coming up at the same time? Ronnie Deeds of Arcades. Just excited to see so many people who uh, care about Coney Island Creek and who have also been to Coney Island Creek. I think, you know, we, we started the outreach on this project and it's amazing how many people from the community are not even aware of what's right in their backyard. Um, and we really hope to change that. Um, also just wanted to call out that there are a lot of people from Coney Island here, so, um, in the first couple of rows, so thanks for, for, for their attendance. Um, so, uh, in the aftermath of Sandy, the, the city uh, had an effort to really think about how we're going to bring New York City back, um, not just to the condition in which we were before, but, but stronger than before. And I think there was a firm recognition by the city and others that we needed to seriously think about our, our commitment to coastal infrastructure and our investment for, for long-term planning and sustainability. Uh, the three key questions that really guided this effort um, with the community um, and also from the city was to, for us to acknowledge what happened during Sandy, to really understand 
um, what were the existing conditions, what were the issues, and really to identify the challenges. Um, what could happen in the future? What, what if we don't do anything at all? What is, what is our reality of the future that we are facing, and how do we start to understand um, the, the parameters that we're working with in identifying future opportunities? And then third, how do we rebuild and prepare for a future with climate change? And that's really where um, we set ourselves up for this study and for some of the other coastal resiliency um, studies going forward, is thinking about um, how do we prepare for the future. So first to talk about what happened during Sandy, Ronnie. Thanks, Elijah. So we're gonna play a video here and it simulates what happened during Hurricane Sandy from a storm surge perspective. So if you can click. And we're, we're gonna play it twice. But what you're gonna see is that along the Atlantic side, it's not where a significant amount of floodwaters breach until you have the large surge. Really what happens is you see the floodwaters coming in from behind in Coney Island Creek and from behind in Sheepshead Bay. So we'll just play it one more time. And it really just draws attention to the fact that Coney Island Creek is a huge source of inundation for the Gravesend and Coney Island communities and looking at potential in water and on land strategies to kind of complete this system. So we can click to the next slide. Great. So as we also now take a look and see what can happen in the future, the two key parts are that we have flooding from the back door of Coney Island Creek and then also Sheep's Head and understanding this low-lying terrain and how do in-water solutions become impactful in Coney Island but also with sea level rise, how do we protect the shoreline? And then more importantly, understanding that this is part of a regional system and that we need to connect and make sure that we have all of the parts necessary to provide complete flood protection to the region of Southern Brooklyn. And, and so building off of what we understand of what we know happened, um, there was uh, within the stronger, more resiliency, more resilient New York, there were over you know, 250 recommendations for how to prepare New York City for climate change and sea level rise. Um, and one of those recommendations was Southern Brooklyn Initiative 5. Um, and that was an initiative that focused on testing the feasibility of a concept of a tidal barrier and wetlands concept. And what that uh, feasibility study really wanted to do as a first order priority was think about how we integrate hydrological management strategies um, to prevent and mitigate upland flooding outside of Coney Island Creek to the communities of Gravesend, Coney Island, and, and also Seagate's another community on the, on the, on the, uh, on the peninsula. Um, and then secondarily, acknowledging that while we're making a significant um, investment or why we're you know trying to structure how this investment would look within the community that we need to think about these these other goals as well how do we um, create strategies to prevent flooding but how do we then think about ecology water quality the environment the access to the waterfront if you if anybody's been to Coney Island Creek you know how hard it is to get actually to the water um, how to and how do we think about the long-standing problems that Coney Island has been dealing with um, and, and integrating that into um, a plan for, for the community. So as Elijah said, um, our first key point is really flood protection and hydrodynamic Per hydrologic management for Coney Island and Coney Island Creek. And we see this as resiliency and a comprehensive approach. It's not enough to just bring flood protection and reliability, but it's understanding how these different potential alternatives relate to our ecological footprint. Are they cost effective for the region? Are the benefits outweighing the costs? How much labor is necessary to operate and maintain these implementation structures and things and what is the cost of maintaining this as well as and most importantly how does this fit into a long-term vision for the community there's no unique solution there's not one solution that's going to be most applicable in every location but how do we make sure that whatever we put in here supports the vision for Coney Island and Gravesend and Seagate and then layering onto that 
ecology and water quality. And actually, Coney Island Creek, it may be an underperforming water body in some points, but it does have a great history of ecology. Um, horseshoe crabs are very prominent in the region, and there are monitoring programs. Uh, different city agencies are examining how to. You can sign up to help uh, count horseshoe crabs in a creek if, you, if you're interested in it. Um, just let me know. <laughs> Parks is doing it. Parks is doing it. <laughs> And then also, Parks has a great effort to restore um, and look at living shorelines at some of the parklands and edge strengthening in Colbert Bow and other locations throughout the creek. So it's another large component. And then as Elijah had mentioned, understanding the community needs and how do we enhance and layer in to flood protection, multi-purpose solutions. So it's kind of hard to see the figure here, but really within Coney Island, you have difficult access through the, by, by foot to the creek and just around the pedestrian access is disjointed. Um, the bicycle network is fragmented and is a large opportunity knowing you have the whole greenway over towards Jamaica Bay. And also just between the north and south sides of the creek, there's sparse direct connections between Gravesend and Coney Island. And looking to see how we can bridge these two neighborhoods with the opportunity of bringing flood protection to the community. And what's, uh, what's great about this moment where we are right now is that this study started a few months ago. Um, there's a, a photograph of just last week. Is my mic going in and out? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a, a photograph of just last week where we, were, uh, we had our community meeting down in Coney Island, um, really soliciting uh, feedback and wanting to hear from people about how do they use the creek? What are their ideas for the creek? Um, how do we think about these goals that we have for our study? And what's nice about this format is that we, you know, and I'm going to pass it over to Michael very shortly, uh, there are the wedge guidelines as well. And, and our guidelines for the study align so nicely with the principles of wedge. Um, and so thinking about the partnerships that are important for this study to go forward, um, we've been reaching out extensively with our partner city agencies, with our partner state and federal agencies, um, and considering all of the you know, parameters that we'd have to consider in a very complicated study, uh, but also um, you know, we need the organizations like this and the people in the room to, to, to listen to and, and give us you know, what their vision is for, um, for the creek so that we can take that into account um, as we start to develop what our recommendations are for our concept designs. And with that, um, you know, obviously there's not gonna, there's not one silver bullet for this. It's a hard nut to crack. Um, there are a lot of different ideas, and that's um, what the next session will focus on. Um, and with all of these, outreach is a really big component of that. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Michael Porto, Director of Outreach and Planning for NWA. Um, this is a real treat to have this many people show up. You throw a party and you hope that people come. There's people, if you look around, trying to bang in like jailmates here. So if, if they want to come in, it's okay. But this is really great. I'm going to be very quick. Uh, we're going to talk about Wedge a little bit, tell you about it. Um, queuing the presentation. So I'm going to talk about Wedge a little bit. Um, it's an incentive program like LEAD. Uh, it's for the waterfront. It's uh, completely voluntary. It's called, it's, there we go. It's really promoting access, resiliency, and ecology, which, as Elijah and uh, Ronnie said, kind of ties very well with, with the project Coney Island Creek. So, so resiliency, access, and ecology. So I'm going to, really, we're going to break out into groups. Uh, some of you are sitting at uh, tables. They're actually labeled. There's an MWA rep. There's an Arcadis and city rep. There's two access tables back there. There's three, two here and one here. Uh, and there's three back there, just to give a sense of the room. <clears throat> so, Wedge is talking about access in a very inclusive, um, community-engaged type of way. We talk about waterfront infrastructure, water-dependent uses, getting people onto and into the water. We talk about programming, stewardship, as Elijah mentioned, getting people involved in actual citizen science and the movement to really care about the waterfront. So we have prompting questions, and we'll have these at your tables, but for access, we want to ask, how do we leverage current infrastructure for enhanced access? How do we integrate access into a resilient waterfront? And how do we encourage bringing people to the waterfront, what, sort of the bread and butter of the MWA? And then resiliency. There's a bit of um, 
sometimes a push and pull with gray and green infrastructure. There usually isn't one answer. And everything is site uh, contextual and, and there's an appropriateness that goes into things. But Wedge really tries to promote graduated edges where, where appropriate. Redundancy, we'd like to sort of promote layered effects. Uh, anything that is redundant can usually withstand uh, some sort of hazard and we'd like to promote that through Wedge. We have various things in the water, stabilizing the, the, uh, the edge and actually creating topography that creates a berm or something that would actually protect as a last resort. So the prompting questions for resiliency. How do you envision the integration of storm surge and stormwater measures? How do we want green infrastructure close to the ocean? How should on land and waterfront edges interact for flood protection? And then finally, ecology. Wedge is really promoting going above and beyond, restoring ecology, catering to the regional goals of the area. Materials, let's think creatively and innovatively about materials. On the left, our friends at Econcrete have created a precast tidal pool that fosters ecological growth. Just an example of the type of things we put forth in Wedge and going above and beyond what's required. Uh, sometimes you do have to provide gray infrastructure and bulkheads. So we have something actually we just got back from Seattle, the American Planning Association. This is very prominent on the West Coast, creating more complexity to foster ecological growth when you do have to do hard edges. And then finally, the prompting questions for ecology. How do we improve water quality before it gets to the creek? Where are opportunities to improve aquatic habitat in the short term? And then think about the long term. What are the key components to a long term ecologically enhanced Coney Island Creek? So, I'm going to take a minute just to explain what we're trying to do here. There's about 80 people. We're going to divide into these lounge areas in the Infinity Lounge. Uh, there are 10 people per table. Like I said, two access back there. So if you're interested in access, we're going to sort of uh, put you over there. There's going to be an Arcadis project rep uh, or a city rep and an NWA rep. We're trying to get to three recommendations. And these rec recommendations, it's part of an exercise of thinking and getting the input from people that actually live there and the experts in the room that come to the MWA conference. So this is exciting. Uh, so we have access, two over there, two for resiliency. If you're interested in resiliency, go to these two tables. Uh, another resiliency one over here and three ecology in the back. Um, we have about 35 minutes to do this. I think we have a little bit more time. We sort of stayed on schedule. Um, and the goal is, like I said, to get to three issues, recommendations that we all sort of come together and try to get a conclusion to. And then we'll have 25 minutes at the end of the session, two to three minutes per table to talk about what we've come up with. Uh, I'm Dara Brawley. I work for Regional Plan Association and have the privilege to be able to be here to help take notes um, for our wonderful group. Um, we are the first of the resiliency teams, um, and our three core recommendations centered around first, education, um, thinking about potentially an elevation tour. What would it look like if all of Coney Island were up 20 feet? Um, and then our second is around flood insurance reform. We had a couple of different ideas there. One was about incentivizing adaptation measures through lower flood insurance rates that um, would benefit folks who are willing to make investments to make their homes um, safer now. Another um, is the formation of potentially a city commission to address and to evaluate what alternatives to our current flood insurance policy would be. Um, and third is that potentially the city could offer an alternative to federal flood insurance rates. I think that's kind of a, a cool idea. Um, uh, then our third and final uh, recommendation is to look at land use reassessment in the Coney Island region. What does it mean to look at how industrial uses, um, what areas they're in versus residential uses, and which ones are most at risk. Go big or go home. I guess they double down. <laughs> uh, now, uh, our second resiliency group. Who's your speaker? No, that's cheating. Come on, guys. Someone else? Come back to them. We'll come back to you guys. We're gonna. We're gonna. <laughs> you can't. No, you can't have the uh, consultants. That's ecology. Oh, ecology. Sorry. We got the consultants. All right. This is my first time doing this. Hi. Um, so our first 
Uh, well, oh, Frank Farrow, New York City Parks Department. Um, not one of the representatives, I just happened to be here, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, uh, our first suggestion was to use, use a multi-layered, multi-tool GI system uh, to mitigate storm impact through infiltration, delay, and filtering stormwater flooding. Um, so we had things like normal infiltration GI ideas, we had ideas about riprap and oyster beds. Um, Oh, green infrastructure, sorry. Uh, our second suggestion was to raise and waterproof existing structures and utilities to protect uh, dwelling spaces, uh, and also to, in terms of the utilities, armor them through use of localized power sources, so solar power for street lights, or wind, local wind power, things like that. Um, and you know, raising dwelling level within existing structures to make it so that if a house floods, at least it floods what is essentially an out basement. Um, and the third idea was to relocate the existing stor uh, stormwater outfall that's along the creek to a different location that would provide some ability to get rid of that water without it flooding the creek the creek and actually contributing to the flooding of coming out. Thank you. Good team, David, for Team Spur. Ready for Okay, ready for apology. Um, we had, uh, a, oh, I'm Ashley Muse uh, with YRG and had a great group here. Um, we talked about both short-term and some long-term ideas um, for some ecological restoration of ecological function. And one of the immediate things that sounded um, really straightforward is uh, encouraging some of the cleanup of trash along the um, part of the community, especially around the amusement zone, um, because it sounds like there's a lot of floating debris in, in the creek and that that's already having a big impact. Um, for anything long term and short term, we briefly discussed the idea of really organizing the surrounding neighborhood around this micro watershed in some sort of uh, eco district idea so that they can be really, um, not just the neighborhood, but other stakeholders can be really involved in understanding what um, ecological restoration efforts are going in and how private land use decisions can, can support that. Um, and, and that kind of relates to the need for really effective stormwater management and planning. Um, throughout the area. Anything else I missed? Oh yeah, and long term, just really thinking about a living um, uh, shoreline um, would do is probably the best thing that could happen for the existing ecology. Thank you. And uh, we have our second ecology group. Hi, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Kristen Marcel and I'm with the DEC Hudson River Estuary Program. And I'm going to try to summarize some of our um, ecological uh, goals here. So one of the first things uh, that came up with us as well is environmental stewardship. And I think there's, there's a few ways we're thinking about using this. One is that it's really important to get the baseline monitoring done now so we know what's in the creek and how it's functioning so that we know whether any strategies are working. And, one way might be to engage the local citizens in getting that done and then having them continue progress uh, on that uh, using citizen science to track how the, the system is, is progressing over time. We also talked about environmental stewardship in the context of uh, maybe landowners or property owners being able to manage their site to reduce stormwater impacts or reduce impacts of CSOs that I guess are already having a major uh, impact on this waterway. Uh, and general education and outreach so that they can understand the, the natural resource that they have uh, near, near their homes. Um, we talked about using green, green infrastructure in larger ways. Uh, for example, the Belt Parkway, uh, a major thoroughfare there, um, but also a, potentially a way to trap uh, some stormwater and convey it to some of the parkland areas that are already identified here along the, the waterway and use those parkway areas as ways to treat that stormwater before it goes out into uh, uh, the creek. And 
Well, another thing we talked about, uh, we learned from the Harbor School uh, folks about some really interesting uh, aquatic life. I didn't realize that there were seahorses and glass eels, sea whelks, all using uh, this resource. And so to the extent that we can uh, continue to use uh, their, their expertise, uh, but also the tidal flushing uh, is, is apparently very important in this area and to the extent we don't want to, we want to make sure that any uh, tidal gates are considering an impact they might have on the migration of species that we learned were in the, the creek, but also um, the tidal flushing, that's it, are, that the, the tide is already doing a great job of helping to manage water quality. And we would want to make sure that any gates were not impeding that, the ability um, of the tidal flushing. We also talked about naturalized and vegetated shorelines as being really important and maybe working with some of the property owners, the larger property owners, to help them use vegetation to create aquatic habitat while they're also increasing resiliency. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to come back over <laughs> to resiliency. <laughs> Hi guys, my name's Matt Goslin. I, uh, I work for NYU. I was nominated to speak, in part because I'm the only one that can read my handwriting. Um, so we talked about most of the issues that you would think we would speak about, the, the soft edges, um, focusing in on the vulnerable areas, uh, creating permeable surfaces, but there were a few unique points that I thought were brought up that I'm, I'm going to mention. Um, and we were thinking about what happens after a storm. Um, in particular, the lack of access to power for residents that are in trouble. So one of the ideas that was brought up was, uh, we need more systems in place, backup power generation, places where people can go to do things as small as charging their cell phone. Um, that was a big deal after Sandy in Coney Island. People couldn't call for help, they couldn't call relatives. So we're thinking about like, a little bit of acceptance that at times, living so close to the ocean, people are going to get wet, and we should have some systems in place to, to help them out. Um, we also thought that during those evacuation periods, we should raise up those coastal highway points, um, that those areas should be protected so that people can get out of these areas when, when they're in trouble. Um, and then the, fa the last thing we talked about was really just empowering people, making funds available to residents to make their own improvements. Um, so sort of this uh, less reliance on the city and a little bit of reliance on the residents to make improvements to their home, to raise up uh, houses and to uh, uh, prepare their basements for future flooding. So did I miss anything? Equity. Oh, and then like those, for those areas where we talked about making elevations and uh, uh, I don't want to say for certain parts that we, we need to make these big decisions on what, what areas are going to become soft and the areas that become permeable and flooded, um, the residents need to be able to, to chime in. Uh, maybe some areas will need to be turn, turned over and the community should have some input on where those areas are. So that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very one NYC. Hi, um, my name is Eddie Mark, and I am with the Coney Island Beautification Project. I actually am a resident in Coney Island, and um, I used to be a former chairperson of the Community Board 13. Um, all right, we have accessibility to the creek. Um, what we discussed was how people can get to the creek from the subway, and one suggestion was to have a bike share uh, going to and from the, uh, to the creek, because right now the creek is a distance away from the public mass transit. So what we uh, suggested was to have a, a bike path going along Neptune Avenue to connect directly to the subways. Uh, we have uh, issues with traffic. Uh, as you know, uh, Coney Island is a seasonal and getting people into the area, it's uh, quite a challenge because there is no parking space for uh, the resident and the beachgoers. So what we all are concerned is 
how do we uh, limit the mass tra uh, driving people coming in by cars and how can we uh, entice them to use mass transit or the bike system as we mentioned. Um, we also uh, had um, the open space. We, we wanted to have the open space planning to support local use for the community resident use. Uh, basically we wanted to, people in the community don't really use the creek side because there's no reason for them to use the creek. Uh, we wanted to give them reason now uh, for it uh, by either having kayaks, um, uh, a boathouse, something that they can identify that this is in their backyard. Um, we also uh, mentioned about giving them a reason to go to the creek side by having uh, either the parks department uh, have a concession there, um, getting uh, a business along the creek side for reason for people to go there to either eat, to shop, to do some other things. Um, as you know, uh, to Coney Island is through the Belt Parkway. Uh, that is the only major highway that comes in. Uh, Coney Island is broken into three other sections, which is Cropsey Avenue, Stillwell Avenue, and Ocean Parkway. Uh, once those get congested, it just backs up. Um, I'm sure people who are driving along the Belt Parkway during the summertime, you see it backed up right along Coney Island uh, area. And uh, one other um, fun stuff that we talked about was um, how to get additional parking. Uh, one idea, which was my idea, uh, was to <laughs> blacktop the train yards. If anyone knows about Coney Island, uh, Coney Island has a train yard or nearby, like about less than three blocks away, is to blacktop the whole train yard and to have off-site parking so that people can, like Disney World, they can park the car on this uh, section and get uh, shuttled in into the area. Um, so that was one of the other ideas. And anything else I'm missing, guys? Yeah, that's it. All right, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go back over to ecology. These are. Hi, my name is Noah Chesnan. I work for the New York Aquarium, also down in Coney Island, quite a bit. And our group had many of the same ideas that have been referenced in the ecology groups, but I guess we'll talk a little bit about a couple of the ideas that we had. The first was to use the existing policy processes like the MS4 permitting, or other sort of larger scale permitting processes to infuse green infrastructure, not just along along the waterfront, but in parcels on the you know on Coney Island as well, um, to improve water quality. Second, um, we also think that it's critical to just raise awareness about the ecological role and the wealth of habitat and wildlife and sort of how that connects to the people that use that area. Um, and so I think Laura, as the final sort of comment, wanted to talk about the hands-on access. Well, one of the um, issues we thought, um, so, you know, increasing awareness of what's out there and hands-on, um, getting people closer to the areas along these along these green belts, um, and and fostering community science type programs. You know, starting at the at the bottom line down with edu with uh, educational lower levels, get them involved, become stewards. That will then pass the information up to their parents and then raise awareness and, and get more folks involved in stewardship activities. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else here we want to... We had a number of really good points that I'm hoping we will take back. That sounded like three recommendations. That's good. That's good. And then last group for access. If you could come over here, I think the mic's struggling to connect. Hi, my name is Laura Clemens. I'm a resiliency consultant for the New York City Housing Authority. We were really fortunate to have a resident in our group, which I think is really beneficial. So we all need to remember as we go out that the residents are the ones that are the experts on their neighborhoods and they can tell us more than we can bring to the table. Um, so the things that we had is that this is important to remember that we're just going back to the way that it was, that we're not reinventing the wheel, that Coney Island, uh, the creek used to have a lot of access points and that we need to maybe do more reflecting on the natural access points that it used to have. Um, we don't want to displace the existing local use. That's really important to the residents, that they're actively using it for fishing and passive enjoyment, like barbecues and picnics. 
So that's going to be really important to remember that we're, our first honor needs to be the people that live there, improving their quality of life, and then bringing in people from outside to enjoy it as well. Wayfinding to um, connect, that's going to be the most important, cheapest thing you can do is wayfinding just to let people know where they can already get access points because there's a number of existing ones. And we need to create a beach to um, create connection and there's an opportunity with the New York City Housing Authority and its potential ability to complete, uh, do a complete streets project or something, a green infrastructure project that creates that sort of pedestrian corridor. Uh, we need to accommodate varying sizes of vessels, everything from private boats to ferry services and small, um, a small boat dock access for human powered boating like kayaking, etc. So there needs to be a wide range of solutions to accommodate for that. And the last thing is connecting businesses, including the marina and the residents to create a stronger sense of community and potentially create more local jobs for the residents that live down in that area because they have limited access to transportation, so creating more local jobs would be great.